Hi there, welcome to this, the Rethinking the Human Factor podcast with me, your host, Bruce Hallas. It's great to have you here with us on the show today. For those of you who are maybe new to the show, what is the show all about? Well, the show is all about raising awareness, influencing behavior, and fostering an organizational culture where information security and data protection are truly valued. So where did the idea of the show come from? Well, the show really comes is a spin out of uh, seven and a half years research that I've been doing into the human factor. And I called my research Rethinking the Human Factor. So here we go, Rethinking the Human Factor podcast, Rethinking the Human Factor book, and just generally rethinking the challenges that you and I face when it comes to awareness, behavior, and culture. So what do we try to do on the show? Well, we really have an absolute focus upon using the show as a platform to share insights from people from outside of the information and data protection community who specialize in awareness, behavior, and culture, and from the great practitioners, people like yourselves, uh, you know, CISOs, education and awareness managers, information security and data protection consultants and practitioners, getting them on the show, getting them to share their insights. So who do we have for you on the show today? Well, today we have our sponsor, uh, David Shipley, Chief Executive of Burison Security. Burison are based out of Canada, but they help clients all over the world with the challenges of education and awareness. And today, David and I are going to be sort of talking about how David's rethought the challenges and, and how that's inspired him and his team to come up with a different approach to helping people like yourselves with the challenges around awareness and behavior and culture. So without any further ado, let's get on with that interview. Now, living up to our promise that we make at the beginning of absolutely all our series, we have another fantastic guest for you today. Now, this is a gentleman by the name of David Shipley. Now, David has got a really interesting past, totally passionate about the challenges that all you listeners are facing in terms of awareness, behavior, and culture. And uh, David and I have spoken in the past, and I just thought, you know, with his passion for it and his experience, and what he's up to now, he'd be a great person to get on the show. So, hi, David. Thank you for joining us on the show. Hi, Bruce. Thanks for this fantastic opportunity. Absolute pleasure. So, um, we always do this to every one of our guests. Who is David? And uh, let us know, you know who you are, what you're doing at present, and what's the journey that you've been that's led you to the point that you're at at the moment. Thanks so much, Bruce. Who am I? I'm an accidental cybersecurity professional. I am. Um, I have been a soldier, a newspaper reporter, a marketer, and on Mother's Day 2012, an event happened to my employer at the time, the University of New Brunswick, that changed my life. And we were we were hacked by a hacktivist group called Team Digital, and they had found a CSQL uh, injection vulnerability uh, through a part of our website that was tied to some non-public information with some databases. And they had breached us along with a number of other public sector entities throughout North America. I became aware of the breach that morning and notified some of my colleagues who worked in the IT department about it and dove into the incident response. And, you know, as a result of that, the CIO asked me to take on the portfolio for cybersecurity and build the practice for this 3,000 employee uh, organization. And it was it was fascinating, and I and I dove into it at first, thinking this was a technological story, and that we could build technological solutions like digital immune systems and everything else. Yeah. And I realized it was a human story, that behind every one of the hundreds of incidents I would learn about, it was always people, process, and culture combined with technology were the root cause. And as we began to work on engaging people, uh, we realized the huge benefits that could be reap from that. We turned them from the passive victims of cybercrime, the sheep as it were, into the active defenders. And we called that the sheepdog effect. And it's why we named a technology we built to power that and our company, uh, Beauceron, after a sheepdog from northern France. Um, because that's the impact we want to have. We want to bring balance back to cybersecurity. And, and two fun notes about my experience at UNB. Number one, you know, we always talk about attribution in cybersecurity. Well, the leader of this particular particular hacktivist group was a U.S. Navy sailor hacking us from a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier, uh, which is the coolest thing I've ever seen because I've only ever heard of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service or NCIS through the American TV show, uh, but now we saw it in real life. Uh, right, okay. It tell me that it's not always China and Russia hacking everybody. No, it's often just people within or in their own nation states, but even within their own organizations, isn't it? 
Absolutely. And so, you know, as we dove into working on empowering the person, you know, I, I had a, a very difficult job. You know, I, I was trying to get, and this is kind of ironic because it's a university of, of higher learning, uh, trying to get people to care about cybersecurity. So we had computer-based training in our LMS that wasn't mandatory because it was a university and you can't force faculty to learn. I know it's ironic. Mm. Uh, and so trying to beg, plead, cajole, get people to take the training. And then we were running phishing simulations and we were using a great tool at the time, but, but the end result of the tool was I got these click rate statistics and a CSV file and it was up to me to try and follow up with thousands of people who fell victim to phishing and create these manual processes and my life was miserable. So we <laughs> create, uh, uh, absolutely. I wanted to it's got better though, hasn't it? It has got so phenomenally better, very, very different, <laughs> but okay. phenomenally better. Um, and so we wanted to create this platform that, that took phishing and education and then did something different. It created an impetus for people to want to care about it. Because I think, and Bruce, I think you would agree with this, is that in 2020, as a general rule in society, we've never been more aware about cybersecurity. But what we haven't done is changed our behavior. And that's hard. And we need a reason to do that. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting because I say, you know, awareness on its own doesn't really mean a great lot. But actually, awareness and being able to prove that people have been made aware has some intrinsic value to a business. But that's, you know, what we would call a tick box exercise. But I think for, you know, majority of people that are listening to to the show and people like yourself, you know, what we genuinely want to do is we genuinely want to shift awareness into behavioural behavioral change or if the behavior is already a good behavior behavioral reinforcement because i think it's interesting over the years that i've been involved in this particular field often the focus is upon those people whose behaviors need changing um but actually there's a group of people whose behaviors are actually in line with policy but and the risk is that we we neglect them Okay, and they see that other people are getting away with it and they slowly shift to actually having um, what I call negative security outcome or behaviours as well. So, you know, for me, I think it's always important. We've got to try and drive behaviours and it's changing behaviours, but it's also re reinforcing existing good behaviours. Absolutely. And that's at the core of this idea that we created a uh, personal cyber risk score. So in this software as a service that we've built, which combines phishing and learning and newsletters and all these activities that are part of your day to day life and saving up to 70 percent of your time. The core of it for the individual is that they can see the impact of their attitudes, awareness, behaviors have on their score. So, for example, you raise a really good point. I often hear from clients. They want to know who the repeat clickers are who consistently falls victim. And I think that's the wrong metric. We have to pay attention to it, but it's not the defining metric. Who are your repeat reporters? Who are the people that are always spotting your phishing simulations or your real threats and taking the time to make sure somebody knows? And how do we recognize and celebrate that? So, you know, that's part of the, the focus that we want to bring to this. And We've seen such a tremendous reaction. We have more than 350,000 people using our, our technology now every day, uh, including some major global banks. And the level of competition, the level of people actually now care about this that we're mm. seeing is um, – it really does make my day. You know, it really is a world of difference from where I was four years ago, begging people to care about security. So can I ask, I mean, you mentioned there about, you know, the repeat clickers. So, you know, the stat of, you know, people who keep reoffending or rebreaking the policy or not following the procedure or not, not complying with the training that they've had. What is so bad? What, in your opinion, what, why is it that it's a bad thing to focus on the negative rather than to focus, focus on the positive? Because I believe, and we have seen hundreds of thousands of simulations, and we're diving into this in new ways, I believe we're looking at phishing and phishing um, fallibility the wrong way. That is to say, I think any person on the wrong day with the right set of circumstances can fall victim to the right fish. And so judging and penalizing people when we aren't accurately as an industry measuring all of the variables that come into that, and most importantly, the most important variables, the emotional state, um, is unfair at best. Um, and I think it is 
um, a lost opportunity at worst. And what I mean by a lost opportunity is like we're diving into, thanks to some help from the Canadian financial sector, a new way of measuring fishing based on an eight emotional scale. And what we want to start looking at isn't just who's the repeat clicker, but what are the commonalities and the kinds of messages they're falling victim? Are there common emotional triggers? And should we be teaching people about their fear response, about emotional hijacking, about how social engineering actually works? Because I think we spent too much time telling people about the technical, tactical signs of a fish, the sender, the time, the attachment type, the typos. Those are all good pieces of advice. But if someone is freaked out and the emotional part of the brain kicks in, that that logical part of the brain, that instruction set may not even get processed. So why aren't we spending more time recognizing, acknowledging the humanity of our people? And I think that's a really interesting point. I mean, a big philosophy that I've had for, for a number of years is design with the human in mind. And I think what you've you've done there, it's, it's something that, again, I'm a big supporter of this, is the sense that you can train people on all the, the different t- t- attack techniques and the things to look at for there, and that's fine. But these things change. Um, and actually, what, you know, what you're sort of maybe you're focusing upon is, you know, to understand when you're at your most susceptible to heighten your, uh, your your situational awareness that these are the points where I'm most likely to do something I come to regret. Exactly. And for example, like some of the work that we're pioneering is how do we have conversations with folks to say, listen, at 6 a.m. in the morning when you first woke up and you're just groggy and you're trying to read something on your phone, you know, if you see something weird, don't engage with it. Wait till you've had your coffee, wait till you're at your desktop, wait till you're awake and see it. And if something really, really pushes your emotional buttons, take a pause. Now, this is good news for the employer and for security all at once, because we're all too quick to fire off responses to email, to use that to dominate our lives. And there are lots of people that specialize in that field. But where we can tie security into that is taking a calm uh, approach to these, you know, keep calm and carry on with your email, uh, might protect you and your organization from inadvertent mistakes or malicious attacks. So sometimes there was a, there's a brilliant uh, fellow, he runs the, uh, the FinTech Accelerator in London, and uh, he told me once, he was an ex-British military, and he said, uh, uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Uh, something to that effect around British Special Forces in terms of, you know, that, that speed is often the worst thing you can get into. That, that making sure you take your time, get it right, then you'll get fast um, mm. is the best way to be proficient. And yep. we all need to slow down uh, when it comes to our digital lives. Yeah. Okay. Now, that's really interesting because I think what you're pulling in there is – is a conversation I've earlier had on a couple of occasions. So, I, you know, it's great to hear you sort of, sort of allude to that, is how culturally the world we live in adds that creates an environment where people are more likely, okay, to click on things. So something I've done a lot of work around is heuristics and biases and how in a given situation we don't think about things, we actually just do it. And we're relying upon a, a range of heuristics and biases, shortcuts, that is the phrase that's used and, and one of the things that, I kept, that I've looked at over, over the years. Now, what you're talking about there is almost like the the environment that we create within workspaces and you know, highly stressed environment. So you, the gentleman you were talking about, you know, military service. So um, they're thinking, you know, be slow, but then the process is frictionless, which it actually just allows you to move through a problem to result at the end of the day. But a lot of the environments that a lot of our listeners are working in, there is a really high pressure very, very high pressure for them as an individual, let alone the people I've got to work with. So so are you sort of proposing that actually part of what we need to think about is, I guess, the environment we create as an organisation and how that could potentially have an impact on the likelihood that somebody's going to click on a link or or break some form of policy. Absolutely. And I I think to to dive into a little bit further, because I've been doing a lot of learning and research about the problem we have in cyber is not a new problem. If we look at the aviation industry as a really, really powerful example. So if you look at the accidents per million departures, you know, they had some declines between the 1950s and the 1990s, the largely attributable to technological improvements, better planes, engines, cockpits, technologies, etc. But then you look at the 1990s, they shift a focus to the human factors, and they focus on the air crews in the actual uh, cockpit, the, the pilot, the co-pilots, the engine 
engineers, the, the flight attendants, as well as the aircraft maintenance folks. And they put a really big program on the culture in the cockpit, challenging the pilot who was previously the almighty God to say, have you noticed this? Are you aware of X, et cetera? So slowing down and challenging and creating that comfort zone to do that. And in the, in the maintenance tech side, they created processes to acknowledge their humanity. So checklists and tags and, and things that dramatically improved. And we saw the safety record improve by almost 87% just through the focus of the human factors. And part of the human factors push looked at what was called the pair model. Has that come up in, in past conversations? Uh, the power model, no, no, none of our guests have actually brought it up. And quite a few of the things you've, you're, you're flagging up, I'm going, this is exciting. <laughs> Excellent. So, so I've been doing a lot of research about people that are far smarter than I. And, and, and so going into this FAA report talking about the human factors was really powerful for me because they laid out this framework and it stands for people, environment, actions, and um, uh, resources. So people, who are the people? What are they doing? Understanding your users, your base. Environment, how do they work? So if they're if they're a bank, for example, are they executives? Are they frontline tellers? Are they investment wealth management folks? Actions, what are the type of things they do every day repetitively? What are the risks associated with those actions? How do we mitigate those? And finally, resources. You know, how do we provide better tools? Check checklists, uh, report a fish buttons, processes, et cetera, to support them. And so yeah. here we had this perfect example with, with all the return on investment, the data we could have from the aviation industry, and we should leverage it. And then finally, I will put in a plug. Uh, there's an additional layer of depth to this human factors, and they called it the dirty dozen. And it came from a brilliant person with Transport Canada, and it was the, the 12 most common human errors in the aircraft maintenance world. And, and I'm doing some work now to help talk about the dirty dozen in our context. So, you know, my, my, my sum up point on that is, the human factors matter. We've seen how that matters in high, high life and death situations in the aviation industry that operates at extreme efficiency at high speeds, and we've seen the difference it can make. How do we take those lessons and apply them in a beneficial way? And one other thing is that, you know, the, the, the learning from each other. You know, these podcasts, the work you're doing, Bruce, is huge because we need to share our learnings. That We know the criminals share their learning all over the place. We do a terrible job as an industry and a sector sharing our knowledge freely for how we can create a better and more safe uh, world for cybersecurity. So, you know, how do we do that effectively? Yeah, I, I, and I think on that last point, I think one of the problems is that the focus on the human factor is, you know, I've been involved in governance risk and compliance for 20 years. And it's only really in the last seven and a half years that I've taken the time out to sit back and really, really think about the challenges of, you know, I've done all these policies, processes and procedures, but actually the only way these bring really meaningful benefit to organisation is when I actually get people to change their behaviour in line with that right? and to manage the risk that maybe they don't. And and so I started thinking about it in the past seven, seven and a half years. And back then I was like, Look, there isn't a lot being done around this. And you just had to walk around the conferences uh, and the exhibition stands and you and the folks focus was completely on tactical interventions in terms of technology and software, really, more than anything. It's only recently that that, that has changed, which is, which is great. But it does mean that to a certain degree, the maturity of the industry in terms of how we look at awareness, behavior and culture is somewhat behind the rest of what's been going on in the security space. And and by maturity, I mean both the way we think about it, but also the resources that are available to that, which is why your example of drawing an analogy with the problem of awareness, behavior, and culture in the airline industry is is great because, you know, I'm a huge believer. I mean, kicked off a project called the Analogies Project. You know, often the biggest breakthroughs for humanity have come by not looking within the industry itself, but have come from looking at industries outside who have the same challenges of awareness, behavior, and culture. And um, there's an interview with uh, on the series one of the show with a guy called John Pollock, who used to write speeches for the ex-US President Bill Clinton. And he writes all about the power of analogy. And in that, he really, really explains very, very clearly a series of examples where, you know, um, big breakthroughs for humanity came from listening to other people. <laughs> 
absolutely. And, and in fact, you know, some of the most effective storytelling techniques are parables. You know, if you look at the uh, Judeo-Christian um, tradition and history, you know, some of these really powerful, impactful messages are tied into analogies that were digestible to the audiences at the time receiving them. So, so, so history tells us there, there's a way, and, and, and we're storytellers, we're story consumers. So that's one other element that we're trying to transform in Boceron is, you know, far too often there's a giant focus in the security awareness building uh, business about, uh, you know, giant libraries of generic content. Look at all this content we have. We've got thousands of modules. Well, A, the biggest cost of a security awareness campaign is not buying a platform. It's your user's time on task doing that. And generic content might be great if you've never done anything before. But if, if you're in your mature phase of your campaign, your, your people want to know, how is this relevant to my organization, my job, our industry, to my family? How is this related to our policies? We have to put the effort in to customize the content to make it relevant. And we need to tell the stories within our organization. And and adopt um, something that, that Matthew Syed in his book, Black Box Culture, did a fantastic oh, yeah. job, which is, you know, talking about problems in a non-blame way so that we take the painful lessons learned and apply them. So so we need to shift the culture within organizations of sort of not talking about that, that wire transmit fraud that happened or that malware incident that happened. We should be talking about this to everybody inside the organization. And I'll give you an example of that kind of culture. So one of our customers, and we have a, we're in every kind of vertical you can imagine, but this particular customer is a is a brewery. And, and in Canada, we're big fans of, of beer, so making sure we're protecting our breweries is a is an intrinsic Absolute, for me as critical well. Critical national infrastructure. I critical understand. national infrastructure. <laughs> and, and, and so this was a 200 some person brewery, and the CEO uh, they had implemented our technology, and the CEO was having a town hall, and he talked about how he fell victim to a phishing simulation. How he didn't think he'd ever fall victim, didn't think this was a thing, and how it really opened his eyes. And it was transformative for that organization. Mm -hmm. um, it helped people say, well, if the CEO is comfortable talking about when he made a mistake, I can be comfortable about that. And I want yeah. to talk about the value of mistakes for a second. You okay. know. One of the other things that bugs me about the repeat clicker thing is I don't think we create opportunities for people to learn from their mistakes in a proactive way. So this was actually something that was passed on to us by our early customer, one of our largest customers, a Canadian global bank. So initially in our score model, if you clicked on a fish, your score, your risk score would increase. If you clicked on another one within a short time frame, it really increased. And the only way to get your points back was to stop doing that behavior. What they asked us to do was to give reward points when people reported a fish. And I said, okay, well, that makes sense. And if people reported the fish and took remedial training and it was their first time falling victim, what they wanted was the person would end up with a better score than when they started. And I said, well, that's interesting. Like, why would they be better than when they started? Because if you've taught a person how to avoid this better in the future, but you've reinforced, most importantly, tell us when this happens to you so we can help you, you truly have... Um, created a positive cycle for that individual. That it's not about falling victim, it's about asking for help. And I thought, this is phenomenal, we have to incorporate this. Yeah, and I think that, that that's really important. I mean, it's one of the, um, it, it's the traffic from an education and awareness perspective isn't just being pushed out, it's about people reaching back to the subject matter specialist or to libraries of information. And, and that's one of the interesting things about um, any form of communication. I mean, you know, it is a two way process. And so you need to be able to get people who, who engage back with you. I'm going to ask you a question here because you raise a really, really important point. Um, when you talked about cost of, OK, so you would, you're pointing out that, you know, the, the, the main cost of um, some sort of awareness educational piece using is not the platform itself. Okay, I think it's a really important point. It's not the platform itself or the content. It's the cost of taking of the time taken to get people in front of it. Yeah, 
Uh, absolutely. Like when, when I'm dealing with clients, um, very few times am I selling to other security firms. I'm selling to banks. I'm selling to transportation companies, manufacturing, government, IT, other things. Their business is serving the needs of their clients or customers or in healthcare, meeting the needs of patients. So they're not in the security business. So every hour spent on security awareness uh, is an hour off time on tasks with other activities. And, and that, that generally speaking, at least for our platform, is significant significantly more expensive than the cost of licensing the software. And so, you know, we've seen where the the cost of your employee time is 10 times the cost of a platform. So okay. really the, the question that you want to ask is, what am I getting for that total cost of awareness? So that, that TCA, as it were. Yeah. And, yeah. and there are two things. If you want to generate compliance metrics, listen, I, I get it. I don't mean to be down on compliance. There are lots of really <laughs> that come from come from compliance. So so yeah. I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to say there's more. You can exceed compliance. You can you can fulfill the intention of compliance and go beyond. And and that's really where you want to be if you want to hit behavior change and reduce risk. And and you go beyond compliance when you provide relevant, contextual, timely, specific content to your users. Users. So don't mm -hmm. just feed them the canned password video because, hey, the latest vendor came out and this video is super funny and it's it's the same password message you've heard before. Instead, tell them a story about what's been happening in your industry or a recent incident to your business because that'll yep. feel real. They're, they're adults. They want to yep. know what's going on and why this is relevant. Secondly, and this is something I think is missing, Bruce, I'd love to get your perspective. I see a lot of textbooks say you should survey your users before you conduct security awareness activities to base line, how much do they know, where are the problem areas at, et cetera. And across, we've done 150 different organizations now, not a single one of them had ever been surveying. And we introduced a universal survey with common questions and actually some of the cool questions we've iterated on, like we used to ask a question, do you think senior management cares about cybersecurity? And it's been an interesting answer. In our 2020 survey, we ask a better question. Does your manager or supervisor care about security? And yeah. we're gonna use that data to generate better leading metrics about risk, about engagement, about iteration and building on programs. So, you know, that's, that's something I'm really fired up about is how do we listen to our users to create better security awareness and behavior change experiences. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think there is a place for surveys, um, but it's it's quite interesting when it comes to surveys is um, when surveys arrive, how we actually prompts awareness. Yes. Um, so it's it sort of, you could argue it's a good tool in the sense that it's a, a gentle reminder. But it also, when it's combined with an activity, which is so you design, it comes shortly afterwards. There is maybe a there is an argument that there's a heightened level of awareness more to what is the standard day to day operational levels of of awareness, and that so sometimes there is like a sort of an argument for doing surveys. But there's also a, it depends if it's then used in conjunction with a follow up activity which is aimed to test awareness. Yes. It's sort of it peaks it and so surveys can be great tools but i think they sometimes they can they can hit a couple of problems as well and the other thing we've seen quite a lot of research upon around general surveys is how people are inclined to answer surveys based upon what they think they should be saying so you, you absolutely have that bias. So some things that we've tried to build in our platform. When So in our default workflow, so, so a user gets onboarded into the platform, the first thing they get is their awareness survey. And it says right at the top, your answers will be confidential. And we don't reveal the individual's answers back to the organization. Mm. And, and we found, you know, if this is people telling us what we want to hear, uh, the answers still aren't great. So we think people are being pretty honest with us, particularly around issues like password reuse, around do I store work information in the personal cloud, because they didn't even realize that was a problem or a thing. And then yeah. you follow up, exactly your point, you follow the survey up with some learning, and you teach people the fundamentals about cybersecurity, and many organizations, half of which in North America still don't do cybersecurity training. I think I saw a stat that somewhere's around 40% in the UK um, still don't do a formal cybersecurity awareness training program. So, so measure where people are at, both not just their knowledge, but also their attitudes and behaviors. Do you think your organization is a target? Does management care? These are important questions for them as well. Yeah. Teach, then test with simulations or other means. So we do a, an automated randomized phishing, which, which has got some interesting data, and I'll talk about that later. 
And then finally, after they've done their initial few fishes, they've done their training, circle back, ask them, do you feel like you've benefited from this? Is there more information you need? Um, do you have any suggestions on how we can improve and create that feedback loop? And we've seen that used very successfully. So, so that's been amazing. But I, but I, I will pause. I'll, I'll dive into the automated fishing in a bit because I think there's a way for security awareness programs to be uh, measuring and having an impact on threat and incident response plans for organizations. Before we go on to that, I just wanted to bring this back because the point you make about the user cost. Um, how does that tie in? Do you have any views on how much time people get to actually take part in training? Because if the main cost is in actually the time that people have to step away from their delivery, you know, supporting the organization to deliver its services and products to its clients, then arguably, and some would say we need to do more training. That means more training in terms of time. People need to spend more time training. That means the costs actually increase. So what's your view on whether or not people have sufficient time to do training you know uh, do you think it needs to be increased or do you think we just need to get cleverer with it what's your view so so a couple of different different thoughts on that so now keep in mind that what i'm about to share is based on calculations using an algorithm we developed so i'll be very transparent about that but but this is the data i have this is the methodology i have so if you look at how we score things, we score things as 500 is you're doing great, but you, you can never have zero risk. So there's a bit of a, of a floor and a thousand you're doing poorly. So most users, when they start in our system, end up with a score between 750 and 800 because our system doesn't know your answers. It hasn't tested you yet, et cetera. Now, what we've seen over a year across all of our clients is on average, clients reduce that score. They reduce that risk by about 20 to 25% across their employees. And they get most of them use an hour long time in the platform methodology. That is the time for the survey, the courses, and maybe some follow up training that's delivered via newsletter um, and our system is kind of fun because you can send security newsletters and tag links to see if people read them and reward them for that um, or maybe they assign an additional training mid-year sort of bringing them up to speed on latest threats etc but but in general spend about an hour in the platform per year and they've seen a reduction of 20 to 25 percent and so most are really happy about that what I what I don't have for data is what is the declining rate of return for investing time Time. Is it that if you spend an hour, you get to 20% and in two hours, you get a 50% risk reduction? I don't know yet. I really want to prove that. And so we're working on that kind of data. But I generally feel like an hour to an hour and a half is the balance point for most organizations. I think two hours in cybersecurity training for general employees, uh, probably not. But for, say, specialized roles, maybe for um, IT software developers, yeah, two hours, including some significant uh, time spent on software, de uh, software development lifecycle or secure coding has incremental value. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So do you want to go back to the um, what you were talking about in terms of the the, the algorithm and the automa automation side of things? Yeah. So the so the one thing I wanted to say this is something I'm really passionate about because we run into this a lot. We're still seeing a lot of organizations that run annual phishing campaigns or quarterly phishing campaigns, and. I don't think those have the value that people think they do. I think they, they generate a statistic. Is it an accurate measurement of where your users are actually at on an ongoing basis? No. Um, and can uh, click statistics be misleading? Yes. But in a methodology that we've pursued is we've automated the phishing within our platform. And I would say 90% of our customers actually adopt this methodology where they fish their users once per month at a random date and time using a pre-banked pool of fishes. Now, this avoids the gopher effect. That is, everyone in the department gets the same fish in a relatively short period of time, and, and, and Sally pops up in the cubicle farm and says, don't click on that. It's from IT. Yeah. Uh, so they avoid the gopher effect, but they also are simulating more accurately what their what their actual real threats look like. You know, criminals don't do quarterly fishing. You know, I joked with one client, they're like, well, we fish quarterly. And I said, like, great, criminals are fishing daily. So yeah, you know, yeah. how are you going to yeah. improve this? And it's better for someone to fall victim to a simulation than a real fish. So we found the once per month is giving some really interesting um, baseline metrics for organizations, including when do people fall victim? 
When are they yeah. most likely to click on a fish? What kinds of fishes work? What times of year within an organization? So, it, you know, it, it's kind of a basic principle. The more you do experiments, the better design the experiments, the more useful the data. If you do quarterly fishing, you're really not changing behavior and you're certainly not gathering the data. You know, we've seen a number of our clients actually use their time to click um, data and when people are clicking to look at how their operation centers are set up, how their incident response processes work, because they know that, for example, 30% of their employees will fall victim in under 10 minutes to a fish. If that's a cred fish, then they have a sense for what the clock looks like for when creds could be in the hands of criminals, which is very useful. Yeah, that's really interesting because on projects that, that I've been involved in, that's a you know, great philosophy I had. This is like design with the human in mind. And there's this huge amount of data that's actually being generated through a variety of different tactical interventions. And a lot of that can be mined to better inform decisions that people are making about things like, you know, resourcing uh, centres, for example, where you're going to have incidents being reported. And I think the, the, the interesting thing about identifying when people are most likely to click. So I know that I've worked with an organisation spring straight to mind because this was one of the big things that came from understanding their, their phishing click was like, when are people cl clicking? And then taking that context into environment in terms of how you designed your whole education and awareness piece exactly um, yeah and and it's interesting because i think this is something that i have never seen in seven and a half years of doing research and interviewing a lot of people i've never seen as part of an education and awareness strategy what i call a data strategy Yes. Yes. And that it, yeah. It's like, OK, what are your what are your strategic objectives and your operational objectives? But what is your data strategy to better inform the decisions you make? OK, to achieve to enable you to achieve the strategic and operational uh, targets. And and, you know, that, that like you have a data strategy for marketing. Okay, you have a content strategy for marketing. Okay, really, in many respects, I mean, you come from a marketing background yourself. You know, what we're talking about here is it's like a marketing campaign, you know, uh, making people aware of the behavior we want from them. Okay, in the case of marketeer, it's to buy product A over product B. You create a, a series of data sets along the way and on the way back to enable you to better inform how you tweak the next time you're, ra you're raising awareness. And, and that's what you're talking about, you know, that whole testing piece as well, isn't it? It is. And in, let's be very transparent about our industry. You know, this security awareness and behavior change is cybersecurity marketing. You know, yeah. we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's so many great examples, you know, from nudging and behavior change and, ex and gamification examples in all kinds of contexts and industries that we should be using and and how we get our messages like the the best security awareness campaigns. And, and, and it's, you know, I say this as a, as a person who leads a company making a software as a solution service solution to helping with cybersecurity awareness. But I will tell any customer any day buying a platform does not solve your problem. It's going to help. And then the best value that we do is we get people engaged and we free up your time. But you still need to run an integrated marketing campaign with other activities. The most mature organizations, you know, they have workshops, town halls, posters, executives demonstrating in other ways outside of the platform, creating that reinforcement mechanism. Just like when Apple or, or Microsoft is rolling out a major new product, that they don't just buy an ad in the newspaper. You know, yeah. you have to have a plan for all of these things if you truly want. And I know I'm preaching to the converted, to the to you and, and large parts of your audiences, but it, it truly is. It, and, I, and I think we're one of the things that makes me so angry about cybersecurity, Bruce, is that we're out of balance. You know, um, and I think we've talked before about the meaning of the word cyber. You know, if we dive down into the original Greek word and, and the reason why Norbert Weiner, who, who created the field of cybernetics, used kybernetes, the, the steersman, as the root of that is because it illustrates the people, technology, and control are the three elements of cyber. Well, for the last 25 years, we've been running around still trying to use technology silver bullets to control humans. Yeah, I know, I know. And then that's the thing. People, they talk about, you know, the, the people process technology. But then some people have got technology process people. And personally, I think the people bit has been neglected for a very, very long time, just like you. I just think the process bit as well, to a certain degree. I mean, a big thing I'm really keen on promoting is um, sometimes it's not 
the effectiveness of your education awareness program and the actual behavioral change there's a lot of the stuff that we talk about it's actually about designing the right product yeah, and process. yeah the process it's like process design it's process design okay one of the big disciplines that i went away and studied is you know if you can get the process designed properly taking into consideration a whole range of behavioral influences what you can do is you can make marginal improvements which reduce the overall likelihood that somebody's going to choose not to comply Oh, you're 100 percent. Let me give you a great example. When I when I first started um, running the fishing simulations at, at the University of New Brunswick, one of the mistakes that we made was we had set up fishing at unb.ca and it would just dump it into our help desk queue. And that was the worst process decision we could ever make. And you might be thinking, listening to this, why is sending it to your help desk the worst thing? Because most help desks are oriented to time to close, resolution-based metrics, their pay, their performance, their management is all based on that. So they don't want to deal with a bunch of simulations, which are, for the most part, from their view, non-IT issues, and they don't respond back to users thanking them, congratulate them, job well done, you caught the fish. It's terrible. It's a terrible experience for the end users. So what we did was we automated that process. People reported the fish. If it was a simulation, you know, using our button or a forwarding mechanism, we'd intercept it before it hit the help desk, uh, before yeah. it hit the incident response folks, create the positive feedback loop, and then for real stuff, send it on to a team to actually dive in, deal with, and they can actually go back in our platform if it really was a threat, come back and congratulate the user for catching a threat. Okay. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a processing exactly to your point. Now, this is the point where I give you the... <laughs> okay. Really, no, the, that point is a really, really important. But big thing that I do around the training, the courses that I run is what I call KPI clash. Yes. Okay? And that is where, and this really is missing from, I mean, it's a lot of the, the, the projects I've been involved with and where I've been asked to come in and reassess where people have got to and some of the challenges they're facing. KPI clash. This is where the KPIs of anybody responsible for education and awareness and behavioral change culture within the security data protection context come into clash with other stakeholders' KPIs. And suddenly you're like, people start working on best endeavors basis. And they're like, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll look to do that. You know, we'll, of course, we want to help you. Everybody wants to help. OK, but ultimately, their performance is measured against something else, which comes into com which comes into conflict with your own KPIs against which you're measured. And that is the reason why you ha when you're doing strategy around this and I'm talking about three year strategy and then your operational getting your metrics all lined up, etc. you cannot you can't do it in isolation because you're going to be tagging. You're going to be pulling on so many other stakeholders. You've got to make sure your KPIs don't clash. And if they do, you've got to have a proper mature discussion about how you're going to manage that when it does happen. So I, brilliant. I think you've raised a really great point. So another great point on process is, and this goes back to the value of surveying. Like we ask a, a question, like, have you shared your work password with others? And one of the options we said, yes, but it was necessary for work purposes. And we've seen that in 7% of all organizations where users say, yeah, I've had to share my work password, I need to. And we've seen examples in healthcare, whether it's the system was too slow to log off and log on. So nurses running the uh, triage desk, they didn't have time for that. Lives mattered and, and they need to go or production lines where if someone logged off with their account, the production line shut down. So they just, you know, Bill stayed logged in for the whole time. Little realizing that Bill's login also tied to all of Bill's personal data and other things, and it made incident response a nightmare. And so mm. when we listen to our users, they will tell us about these friction points, about these processes yeah. that, that no one cares when I report security concerns, or I don't do this thing because it actually would have a negative impact on my work and the things that I'm actually measured against. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think it was series two when we did the interview with Dan Arley. <laughs> and I just remember Dan was talking about how he, you know, he was uh, the problems he has with complying with the, the IT security policy because, you know, and a lot of his colleagues were, this gets in the way of me doing my job. And that's what I'm being measured against. And and I think that, you know, it creates a friction. And one of the things we know from a behavioral perspective is, you know, you, you minimize the friction to allow behaviors to to grow in the right direction. Um, and and so, yeah, it, you, you've got to be very, very aware of what people's, what they're being measured against and how you could have a potential impact upon that. Or 
how you could actually help contribute to, towards their performance, which is always an important thing, you know, focusing on the positive rather than just the negative. Exactly. And, you know, what's interesting to me is that, like, so part of our platform is you can um, you can take any of the out-of-the-box content we have and completely customize it. And you know what, ironically, is one of the most requested upon customizations for our platform? What's that? We give advice constantly telling users about two-factor authentication and about password managers. And the number of organizations that contact us and say, you have to take one or both of these out because we don't provide these to our users. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, we could use this as a positive to talk about how you're now providing this program in addition to your security awareness. Because, you know, as much as I talk about the importance of empowering the human, you still have to have the car for them to drive. You know, it's not an either or situation. It's not like we don't need a car with steering wheel, brakes, uh, turn signals, lights, et cetera. The technology piece is the car, but we need to educate our drivers on how to drive the car safely. But you, you've got to provide them those safety features. Yeah, right. So um, I think, I guess, as a, a closing part to our discussion, what do you think is the biggest opportunity for the industry to move forward upon when it comes to the challenges around around the human factor? I mean, obviously, you and your organization are, you know, you've got your own your own focus. But when you step back as somebody that looks at the industry, you, you know, having having worked at the sharp end as well, like a lot of our listeners responsible for it within an organization. But having stepped that back now and taking more of an industry broad perspective, what do you think is like, okay, this is the stuff which is coming down here that I think we need to be paying attention to? So, so two-part answer to that question, and I'll try and be brief. I, I, I think we all have to have a gut check moment looking at where we are in the general field of cybersecurity and acknowledging the status quo is a failure. You know, we're spending $170 billion on cybersecurity tools, services, consulting, et cetera, and losses, conservative estimates for losses range from $2 trillion to $6 trillion. You know, we've, we've tripled, quadrupled our spending and our losses are increasing exponentially. And when we dive into our spending, you know, we spend $2.5 billion of that $170 billion on the human side. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should focus more on the human side. The numbers are there. In any other business, if I presented your executives and said, uh, Mr. Senior Executive, CEO, Madam CFO, Madam CEO, we need to four times increase our IT budget. By the way, our losses are going to probably increase by five to ten side. They, they tell you to give your head a shake. You know, that mm-hmm. makes no sense. We need to give our head a shake. That 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 people matter and that constantly chasing the latest AI powered deep learning machine learning, blockchain, security tool that promises to make all your dreams come true and all your threats go away isn't worked out. So can we stop? You know, the real meaningful change is going to require a combination of tooling. Yes, we need our security tools, but we have to engage our humans and we need strategies and plans. And to do that, we need data. So so my my second part answer to your question is what's going to change the industry is data-driven decision-making around security awareness. Looking iterating, improving, building, constantly measuring. And that's the methodology that we're um, so passionate about and pioneering. Um, And we want to see everybody in the awareness and behavior change industry adopt. Um, I would love to see us have a common set of real meaningful metrics that we all agree on. You know, we need to develop the profession of security awareness and behavior change further. uh, And we need to be the CPAs, the accountants uh, of the human side of these businesses that executives can rely on and trust. That's the future we can build that will truly reduce risk. And so that is my two-part answer. My bonus round is we need to collaborate more. You know, if there's one hope I have for 2020s, for this decade, is this is the decade where, you know, as we're running on the treadmill listening to our podcast, we're sharing these ideas within and to other organizations. That that we give of what we know, not just for profit motives. Yes, we have to make money and be in businesses and, 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 and be professionals on the security awareness consultant side, but we're in this for something far greater. So let's tap into that um, because doing that will put a dent in the criminal enterprise. Excellent. So I'm going to summarize that people matter, which is a, you know, I think it's great. But, you know, for me, I'm like, that, that summarizes up, up what you're saying there. People matter. Yeah. And that the data strategy piece, I love that. Okay, as well. But <laughs> people matter. Right. It's been an absolute pleasure, David, to have you on the show. It, it's great. I mean, I am so privileged. I get all these guests come on the show. 
from outside the security and inside the security. But, you know, the one thing that really connects all of them in so many ways is they're all so passionate about what they do. And that's clearly the case with you as well. So thank you very much for joining us on the show, David. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Bruce. And thanks for uh, providing this platform to, to have this conversation. And thank you for your time. Absolute pleasure. Hi there. Well, I hope you found that really interesting. I know I certainly did. And, you know, David is just, I mean, these people are setting up these companies, absolutely passionate. And I think I really love about um, a lot of the people that set up these early stage companies is that, you know, they've come from the problem. They, for me, they are you, that you, the listeners, um, they have done what you're doing. And then they've made the decision to take the risky road and to, with ideas in their mind, they've tried to set up their own organisations and try to help the industry sort of rethink the human factor and to rethink and do and to challenge how it's currently going about addressing that from a platform perspective. So great to have David on the show and um, really appreciate the support that him and Birakon had given us in terms of sponsoring what we're up to today. So if you find these insights interesting, I really do hope you do. And, you know, it's insights from this show, but all the other shows that are in the Rethinking the Human Factor podcast, then how can you best go about learning more insights, learning how to apply those insights to better help you achieve the things that you're being measured against in terms of uh, the human factor within your own organizations? Well, luckily for me and ideally for you, uh, I can help out there. So there's three ways that I help individuals like yourselves and the organizations you represent. And that's one, through coaching and mentoring. So I've got my own program uh, to help coach CISOs, education awareness managers and information security and data protection professionals responsible for the human factor to sort of coach and to mentor those individuals towards success. So if you're looking for support, but you don't necessarily want somebody on site all the time, then yeah, the coaching and mentoring program might be able to assist you there. The second thing that we do, or I do specifically at the moment, is that you know I run a number of workshops and also I do some training events. So the workshops are really focused upon challenging the status quo in terms of how people even see the problem. And then from that, looking at, okay, now we look at it differently. Okay, what are the options available to us? I can guarantee you that the one-day workshop is an absolute eye-opener. If you look at the website, the testimonials, which now go back three years from CISOs, education awareness managers, security professionals, even people from internal comms and uh, HR, basically highlight, you know, I think what we've done here is we've got something that's really invigorating, really interesting, and it sets people on a, on, on a new path and direction. So yeah, it'd be great to have you come along to one of the workshops. Or oh, by the way, if you want to run the workshop within your organization, we're more than happy to do that. The other thing we do is we do training. So after seven and a half years, uh, the one thing that we've been able to do is boil down that research into a framework, which we now train people to actually implement. This framework has been implemented in a number of organizations, which now span 24 different countries, 140,000 employees. And actually, the content and everything within that has been done in four different languages. And we know that it's even got through an ISO 27001 certification. So, you know, we know that this has been implemented and there are great testimonials from the people that have gone around implementing this as well. So if you want to get trained on how to implement the SAYBAC framework, then, yeah, we can help you with that. And the third thing that we can do is benchmarking. So we use the benchmarking exercise and we assess organizations against that. So normally we will help organizations at the end of their strategic period where they're looking at, okay, where are we? Where do we want to be in three years time? And then we come up with a roadmap about how they can achieve the gaps between where they are and the save back framework. And you know, that's currently being rolled out in a number of different organizations. So yeah, if you're interested in using the save back framework as a benchmark to sort of understand where you are at present and then redefine where you want to be in three years time, then we can help you with that. Best way to get in contact, find out more information about that is to drop me an email at I want to know more at redash thinking the human factor let me repeat that i want to know more at redash thinking the human factor.com so best way to stay in contact with the show subscribe to the podcast obviously through whatever platform that you're using so apple Podcasts, spotify or even through the marmaladebox.com website other ways to stay in contact with what we're up to is to follow us on Twitter or to join the LinkedIn Rethinking the Human Factor Working Group. Another way you can stay in contact with us is to actually 
visit the marmaladebox.com website and to register there for updates. Right, so who is next on the show? Well, this guest is somebody who I was really interested in because they moved from outside the security industry into the security industry, but their industry was sort of semi-security already, but in a different context. And that journey has had some real challenges for this individual. And it was really interesting to listen to somebody coming in from outside the cybersecurity industry and the problems that they faced, especially with this person being responsible for awareness, behavior, and culture. And they were able to share those insights with us on the show. And I hope that they're going to be of some value to you because I think it's really important. It's definitely a mission of mine is that, you know, I want to engage with people outside the security industry and, and let them know that we really need their help within the industry. People who are specialists in different aspects of awareness, behavior, and culture, but maybe not uh, within the context of data protection, information security, cybersecurity, want to let them know, okay, there is a place for them here. We really need to be welcoming them into uh, the industry because they bring so much amazing insights and experience, which is part of the reason why we also get them on the show. So that person is uh, Neil Foster, and Neil is going to be with us in a week's time. So I hope you can join us to listen to what Neil has to say. So in the meantime, I'd just finally like to say thanks for joining us on the show. It would be great if you can join us next week. And in the meantime, rethink the human factor. <laughs>